Welcome to PBS Books. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, the Library Bureau Chief of PBS Books. We are so very glad that you've joined us today. We are here today to celebrate trailblazer Dr. Mae Jemison, author of her soon to be released, re-released memoir, Find Where the Wind Goes. It seems fitting that we have this conversation during the 100 year celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which enabled women to vote, Tra many trailblazers. And then it also seems fitting that it's February, Black History Month. Today, PBS Books and ASALA, which is the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, formally announced a new alliance. We are committed together to highlighting the most important African-American authors of our time and provide insights on issues related to diversity. I am pleased to have Asala's Executive Director, Sylvia Cyrus, here to share a bit more about her organization. Sylvia? Good afternoon, and we are delighted to be here with you. I'd like to share some information about ASALA. That's how we pronounce our acronym. A-S-A-L-H stands for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. It's a lot of words and it really is powerful and means quite a bit. We were founded in 1915, 106 years ago in Chicago, Illinois. Our members, study history, life, and culture, and share that information with teachers and students all across the world. Each year, we set the Black history theme. A theme is what we ask the country and the world to focus on. One aspect, one thought about Black history that can be taken in many different directions. For this year, the theme is the Black family. We want everyone to focus on family traditions, stories, and relatives. And so we have a website that you can visit at www.asalh.org where you can learn more about programs that we're doing as well as the fantastic programs that we are doing this year with PBS Books. We study and celebrate history. History is the study of past events and how they impact our lives today. Before Dr. Carter G. Woodson began studying Black history, very little was written about the amazing contributions of Black people. Dr. Woodson was the founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, our organization, when it was founded in 1915. He realized that if the world did not know about how important Black people were, that they could be eliminated and no one would know that they were here and no one would even care. He knew that Black lives mattered. People like Dr. George Washington Carver, who was born at the end of slavery and was an inventor and a scientist at Tuskegee Institute, which is a historically black college and university, who among his hundreds of amazing inventions did uh, created 300 products from peanuts. And I bet you can guess the one that you know the best, which is peanut butter. There were other individuals who uh, were business people like Madam C.J. Walker, who in the early 1900s, created a manufacturing company for hair care products and became one of the first African-American female millionaires or any black millionaire at all. Similar to the contributions of Jay-Z and Beyonce, they have great musical companies and they also contribute to our life and history. And then there are politicians and people who help us as civil servants like Robert Smalls, who was a former slave and a congressman in South Carolina. And then there's Vice President Kamala Harris. So we encourage you to study more about our history and join us in more programming with PBS Books as we enjoy today's wonderful, wonderful talk with Mae Jemison. Thank you. Sylvia, we are truly honored to partner with Asala to celebrate African Americans life and history throughout the year. So thank you. 
As many of you know, PBS Books works with libraries across the country. And the work that we do is basically we work with libraries, many school libraries, many public libraries, and we partner with them to provide these programs. So we thank all libraries across the country who are participating and sharing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for creating dialogue in your communities. Um, now it is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce Dr. May Jameson. Dr. May is a physician, an, en an engineer, an educator, a social scientist, an entrepreneur, and a former NASA astronaut. She was the first woman of color in the world to go into space in 1992. Dr. May leads the 100 Year Starship Global Initiatives. She's founded two technology companies and a nonprofit called Dorothy Jameson Foundation for Excellence. She was the first real astronaut to appear on the Star Trek TV series. And she even has a Lego minifigure. She grew up in Chicago, attended Stanford University, and did her medical degree at Cornell University. It is my extraordinary honor as someone who has studied the sciences throughout my whole life and as a woman to introduce Dr. May Jameson. Thank you so much for being here today. We are so very, very thrilled to have you and to be able to discuss your, your soon to be re-released book, <laughs> Find <laughs> Where the Wind Goes. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And I'm really pleased to be here with you today and to be such a, be a part of such a great partnership that uh, you all have that PBS has created with Amsala. I'm thrilled. Well, thank you. And before we start, you know, obviously we're going to have a conversation and go into various questions, but I want to encourage all of you out there who have questions as Dr. May and I have a conversation to put those questions in the chat on Facebook if you're on Facebook. Um, we want to hear your questions and there will be time at the end of our session to ask some of those questions. So I always just like audience members to know that. Um, so to start, why did you first write Find Where the Wind Goes back in 2001? And why did you decide to re revisit it and re-release it now? So um, I wrote Find Where the Wind Goes and it was focused toward my 16 year old self. What I would tell my 16 year old self about my life and also how it might have um, impacted you know, the, 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 the journeys that I took. One of the things that, that uh, really motivated me to do this was that friends of mine would see narratives about me where people made stuff up. And it was always, of course, that she was this child that always did what her parents told her to do. And she studied well and she uh, was not rebellious at all. And they would look at it and say, this, we don't know who this person is. <laughs> and so I thought it was really important for me to tell the stories about how I, you know, just some tidbits of stories about how I came to be. So these moments are ones that hit toward the future um, that tell a story about who I intended to be, who I knew I wanted to be, which wasn't necessarily a job, but rather the type of person I wanted to be. And um, I thought it would be as important to, to do that. Why am I re-releasing it now? Well, first of all, it's an update. It, it's a true second edition. So it's it has additional content, right? So we have new content. It also has completely new images. And in fact, the photographs that were in the previous book, they're not there. We actually have illustrations that I helped an artist to conceive some of the events that I talked about because you don't always have that picture of you doing something that was really memorable that uh, changed your world but it was that reason and then finally today as I look around a lot of what's happening is very similar to what I had to 
uh, deal with and digest as I was growing up as a teenager. And what do I mean by that? So I was right in the middle of a, the civil rights movement in the 60s. There was also space exploration was exploding in the sense of there were so many things that were happening. Science, technology, engineering was right at the forefront of things. We had a new, um, a really great uh, connection and engagement with fantasy and different kinds of science fiction and media. And at the same time, everyone was declaring their right to participate. If you look to where we are today, space has a new resurgence, it seems like. There's also um, the whole issue around diversity and inclusion. Who gets to make the decisions, right? Who do you get to be? Um, as well as this whole connection with the world. And then if we look at the pandemic, this connection with the world is about what should our society be in the future? And who gets to make that determination? And so I thought that it would be helpful to bring those back, to, to, to bring that back to the forefront because it's very much like what was happening in the 60s. And it was very much, again, some of those decisions, those things that I had to deal with as a teenager. No, and and I think that's one of the the amazing things about this book for me as I read it because it really, you know, fifty years have, have gone by since riot, right? And yet is it's you know, and I hope we'll jump into that a little bit more later because I wanted to more start in the beginning, but it, it is very surprising how how far we've come and yet how far we have not. Uh, um, Yes, in space, the world has evolved in many ways, but 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 we'll get to that a bit later. Um, okay. I wanted to ask, you know, from an early age, you seemed really determined to be a scientist. Even I think there's a story in the book about you as a kindergartner. I have a four year old, so I I was thinking just of a little May standing up to her, you know, her kindergarten teacher. I wanted to see if you would mind sharing that memory with the audience. Um, what happened? Well, so one of the things, I'll, first thing I'll tell you is I chose my parents well. I don't know how I did it, but I, I chose them well. And I was a third of uh, three children, all of whom my brother and sister are very bright. So coming up, I had to like make my way. Right? <laughs> but um, I don't remember when I knew that I liked science. I just remember helping my brother and sisters with their, my brother and sister with their science projects. And so in kindergarten, when your teacher is asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Of course, I was that kid with my hands up in the air. And as she called on the other children, they said, policeman, you know, fireman, teacher. When she finally got to me, I said, I want to be a scientist. And she said, don't you mean a nurse? Now, there's nothing wrong with being a nurse. But for me, I took offense because it felt like to me, she didn't believe that I could be a scientist or that I even knew what a scientist was. So being the child I was, I just put my hands on my hips and I said, no, I've been a scientist. And I was really quite irritated with her. I know now that she was trying to help me choose a career that she believed as a young black girl growing up on the South side of Chicago in the 1960s that this was a career that I could aspire to or accomplish, but that's not who I intended to be. And Well, so as a backup, like secondary question then, you know, what advice do you have to a young girl coming up now who's kind of told all well-meaning, you don't mean that, do you? I mean, what advice do you have for them about following their big dreams? And I know that's a big question, but well, I think it's the same advice that I give to anyone, right? Which is, it's about really understanding who you intend to be. Who you intend to be isn't always a job. Sometimes it's the, the traits you want to embody. So when I think about it, I wanted to be creative. I wanted to be able to explore uh, many things around the world. I wanted to make a difference in life. I wanted to constantly be engaged and challenge myself. What do I tell? Folks, I think it's usually more you show them, right? Which is also part of the reason that I wrote the book is to sort of show these experiences. But it's really to understand that you have a right to be involved. Then when people use a term and they say, uh, we need to empower people, 
we hold a lot of power ourselves and every day people give it away. To be empowered to me means that you have to recognize and do three things. The first is to recognize you have a right to participate. You have a right to be in this universe. You have a right to participate in what the society becomes, what the world becomes. You have to believe that and you have to own that. Secondly, you have to uh, understand, believe that you have something to contribute. If you don't have believe you have something to contribute, then you'll just sit on the sidelines. But understand you have something to contribute. And the final piece is to risk making that contribution. So many times we're afraid that people may laugh at us, we may fail, but you have to risk making that contribution. And that's how you empower yourself. And in many ways, um, you can accomplish things that you didn't know you could or that others didn't know you could. And I want to just go back with how that might affect uh, young women and women in period are different people. But let's particularly talk about girls and women. So many times in classrooms, girls are asked yes, no questions and girls get the answers right, but they're not asked to elaborate on their answers. Boys are asked to elaborate. So as as girls, we grow up many times um, having to have the right answer, but not asking to pontificate or explore more. And so we always want to be absolutely sure that we have everything, all our ducks in a row before we step out. There's something to be said for that, but there's always something to be said for trying things that you don't know you can do because that stretches you, that pushes you. No, I think that the stretching and pushing is a, is a real theme throughout your book. And one of the things I really appreciate about your book is that you really, you discuss the challenges and the roadblocks that you hit along the way and what made you into the person that you became. I was, I know there are, things sprinkled throughout your book, but if you could give an example of really a formative event um, that really made you who you are, just one that's in your book. I don't know that there's a single formative event that makes you who you are, right? right. But I think, it, I think they help to you to see who you are. So let me think of something. Um, sometimes, remember I talked about having a uh, nerve to do something. Yeah. So I can tell you when I was growing up, I was pr pretty good at school and I did really well and I always had science projects, I always had science projects. And I thought I was pretty jazzy, you know? I was a sophomore in high school and I'm thinking I'm pretty jazzy. And I'm talking about a science project. My mother tells me, why don't you do a science project on sickle cell anemia? Now, I didn't know what sickle cell anemia was. I knew it was a blood disease, but that's basically it. And she, my mother would just challenge me. She would throw stuff out on the table. And she was one of those people who always tell you to go look it up. You got to find out for yourself. And being the kind of teenager I was, I was going to take this challenge up, even if I don't know how to do it. So what was really happened is I ended up calling Cook County Hospital hematology laboratory. That's the big Cook County Hospital in Chicago. I called their hematology lab and I said, uh, may I speak to the head technician? And when he came on, I said, uh, my name is Mae Jemison and I'm working on a science project on sickle cell anemia. And I'd like to know if you all can help me. I, this is a cold call out of the blue. And the uh, technician, he asked me a lot of questions about chemistry and things and he realized I could do stuff. Long story short, I literally ended up doing a project at Cook County with Cook County Hospital, head hematology department, having to come up with a new, with a new drug, a new compound to test against uh, sickle cell formation. I ended up as a sophomore in high school um, learning about, I'm I'm sorry, a sophomore junior in high school, writing off to the National Institutes of Health, reading not just 
college graduate level papers, but papers that scientists were producing out because the head of the hematology department actually challenged me to do even more. And so I learned all of these things. It was all about taking that risk to call. It meant that I had to do a lot of other things. So I would go from the south side of Chicago all the way over to the west side to, to do this work. But consequently, I got to learn so much about different kinds of equipment, electrophoresis, all these things that I would not have learned in high school. But it also helped me to know that I could understand these things. That, that's amazing, right? It's, it's also that initiative and being there, right? You know, getting, getting the right person on the phone or negotiating to get the right person there, that tenacity and persistence. What pushed you to be, to want to become an astronaut? I know that's always something everyone wants to know, you know, what pushed you? And then when you applied, what do you think made you stand out among everyone else. <laughs> so we're going to talk about other stuff because part of the what allowed me to do all of this that people know about was because I was rounded mm -hmm. and grounded in other areas that would compensate for sometimes you don't uh, get all the responses that you want. Being an astronaut is really simple. I want to go into space. <laughs> I mean, I can't do, I didn't necessarily want to be an astronaut. I wanted to go into space. People say that's semantics, but it's not because I could have waited for ET in a cornfield with aluminum foil on my hat, but I, my head, but I didn't think that was going to get me there, right? So I applied to be an astronaut. I assumed since I was a little girl that I would get that I would go into space. I assumed um, because there were so many people, um, you know, space was just all a part of what was happening. Uh, even though there were no US women in the astronaut program, there were no people of color in the program, I knew that was nonsense. You should have seen me running around a little six, seven year old kid telling adults, no, that's foolishness. That doesn't work, I don't care. There's no way you can convince me that it doesn't, that uh, women can't do these things. Um, so I just, I wanted to go into space. And simple as that, how did, you know that cold call that I did to, Cook County Hospital, it was a little bit mirrored <laughs> with how I applied to NASA. There's a little bit more. I had a little bit more knowledge and things then, but I literally called uh, down to Johnson Space Flight Center and said, I'd like to uh, get an application to be an astronaut. Wow. No kidding. And they transferred me to the astronaut selection office. And that's where I got my application stuff. There's a little bit more. I had a little bit more uh, knowledge, but it literally was still a cold call. That's, I mean, that's amazing, right? That's, I mean, to think, but but I do think there's something to, to be said about cold calling even today, because the truth is nowadays, most young people are, they just want to email and text. And if you can actually get someone on the phone, it's amazing the magic that can happen. Um, before we jump into more aspects of your book, I, I can't go on without showing, you know, one of the things that um, <laughs> there is a Lego figure here and, and it has your name on it. And I want to know, how did this happen? Did they call you? Is it like when you get a big award? Hey, Dr. May, we've decided you're, you're it. How did it happen? Well, just like NASA, I would, you know, this one had more to do with people nominating me. You know, I, I was going to tell you with NASA, I would have hoped to have said, you know, they found out how wonderful I was and came to me, but that wasn't it. But <laughs> <laughs> with the Lego figure, um, there was a, a professor in uh, Boston who decided that it would be important for Lego to have women figures and science. And so she designed a Lego set that had a number of women and it ended up getting, I think it was 10,000 signatures it needed for Lego to really take a look at it. Wow. And I was one of the figures that she included in it. And eventually this came out. And did you have any artistic license? Did you get to pick colors or no? What you got is no, like no, I got, I got to help design my blockhead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is so cool. I don't think I've ever gotten to interview someone who had a Lego figure. So, um, but obviously, let's jump a little more into your your book. You know, obviously, 
precocious, super determined. You know, your book discusses this tension between curiosity and dignity. And I was wondering if you could kind of delve into a moment in your life that you discuss in your book in which satisfying your curiosity was at squarely at odds with your your dignity. Oh my God, there's so many times I'm trying to think about, um, I mean, you know, sometimes it's curiosity, sometimes it's when you just want to do something, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I decided I wanted to try out for Anita for all city Chicago West Side Story. I'm in the background. I wanted to dance when I was a little girl and I bullied, whined, got my mother into signing me up for dance classes and I was really good. I was a great dancer. I was very athletic, um, really good dancer, pretty good actress as well. And I did a lot of performing arts and things like that. But I couldn't sing a lick. I mean, I could, I cannot sing. I had a hard time holding a tune, but I love the movie West Side Story. I love the character Anita. And so I decided that I was gonna try out for the West Side Story, all city. This is not my high school. These are all the high school students in the city of Chicago. I'm gonna try out for Anita. And let's just say that I managed to get in, included in a callback of about six to 10 girls because they thought I was really, really good. And I had practiced the songs that Anita sang and everything uh, until they changed the song. Yes, just leave it at that. They changed the song. But it was sort of so it's like your dignity is like, hey, you know, all I can do is try out. And hey, I got caught, you know, but <laughs> I was there. I was there. And I got to be in West Side Story anyway. But uh, there are a lot of different pieces, but that whole, you know, sort of satisfying your curiosity or trying for something that you want to do is there. And sometimes, you know, you, it, it does not work out, you know, and you have to be able to have a sense of humor about things as well. But I got to learn, I got to find out. So there's, that's fine. Yeah, I think the sense of humor is so important growing up, right? To ha be able to laugh at yourself and laugh at when you succeed and laugh when you fail um and it's hard to fail um but but if you don't get back up again right i mean i think your your story also and your your book it it also talks a lot about the theme of tolerance and acceptance um and i and i wanted to kind of explore that a little bit more too and how those values of of tolerance and acceptance shaped who you are um, because you you discuss it in different places, and I think those are also too critical right now for our country, but for young people overall are two important themes for them to understand. So how do you think to tolerance and acceptance um, shaped who you are? And I will use the term, let's use the term tolerance and just recognition that everybody is not the same and recognizing that we will all make mistakes in life, but we do have an opportunity to improve. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, initially, I was in an area called Woodlawn, and it was, uh, at that time, is a very difficult neighborhood. Um, and it was uh, you know, primarily African-American. Um, when I was uh, 11 or 11 years old, I ended up going, we moved to Morgan Park and I ended up going to an integrated uh, school. Now during that time, also with that move, I, um, I skipped seventh grade. My seventh grade teacher in where I was at at Wadsworth, I was there for like two weeks and she said, you don't belong in seventh grade, you have to go into eighth grade. So she put me in eighth grade as we were moving out to Morgan Park. And, and, and so that, changed me in the sense that I was now much younger than any of the other students, but I was tall, so it didn't really matter. The other part of that is uh, from when I was a little girl, um, let's see, nine years old, eight, nine years old, my mother had cut all of our hair short in an afro, short, tiny afro, um, because Mary McCaba, 
who was a South African incredible singer. She was recognized United States. She wore her hair very short. My mother said, Bet, that's what we're gonna do. So this was recognition of who you were. Back then when that happened, most women, black women in the United States would not have worn their hair that way. So all while I was growing up, people used to call me a boy and that was okay because my mother said they're, you know, that's their problem, that's not an issue. But the reason why I bring that up, because that tolerance, I don't know if it's tolerance, but understanding that people are different. And then um, Afros became the thing that everybody you know, started wearing. But in my high school, I had lots of different friends. I had friends from, um, you know, from you know, this platinum blonde, short um, gymnast, uh, science geek with me, my friend, Kathy Sharp. Uh, another friend, Sheila Wong, as well as my friend, Linda, Linda Bundridge, who was, um, you know, sh she was an African-American uh, girl my same age. She had a completely different MO than I did, but we were best friends. So it was, it was this whole thing about recognizing that you have lots in common with different people and being able to allow that to happen. No, I, I think that, that those are wonderful comments. I and I know our, our audience is, is interested in, in asking their, their questions too. So I'm going to ask a few more questions and then we'll transition into audience questions. So if you're out there and want, want your question answered, please put it in the chat and we will be an asking those questions shortly. Um, in terms of you highlighted in your book, that you like to read and um, going to libraries. Uh, you know, is there a favorite library that you remember or a favorite book? And um, how do you think that that impacted your journey, having books and libraries as part of your life? Oh my God, there are so many books that I like. It's like there, there's no single favorite book, right? Um, the libraries. I remember when I was a little when I was, we were living in Woodlawn, I don't remember the name of the library, but we would always go there, me, my brother, my sister and I, we'd always go to the library, we'd take books out. And I was rather precocious in terms of reading. It didn't mean I always understood all the nuances, but I could read all the words in the books. But then when I moved, when we moved to Morgan Park, I used to go to the library there. I was on Monterey Avenue and I would, Get, I would get a lot of um, astronomy and other books. And then I started getting science fiction books and reading those. And some of my favorite science fiction books, I think the first one that I picked up that was knowingly science fiction was called A for Andromeda, which was written by Fred Hoyle, who was an astronomer. And it was about coming up with a, a receiving a signal from another galaxy and it was basically a signal could, could construct a computer which then in turn constructed a life form but before then i had read a wrinkle in time by madeline engel but that was just one of them so she wrote another one called the um, arm of the starfish and the moon by night these each one of them had heroines in them who were very much involved in science, who, and who were very enabled. They were not shy. They weren't uh, uh, awkward or anything like that. No more awkward than any teenager is awkward, but <laughs> they, you know, I love those books. And then I read, I, in high school, I read all kinds of books um, that were about civil rights movement. My mother would constantly hand me books like the the Dehomian by Frank Yerby, which was about a uh, Dehomian prince. And we would get all kinds of books. So it was that wealth of both fiction and nonfiction, a lot of nonfiction that made a difference and helped me see the world in different ways. It was really critically important to me. These days, uh, even, in medical school, I started reading Octavia Butler, who did an incredible science fiction. The first book I read by her was, um, uh, well, Kindred and others. So she just, there was just uh, this in incredible people who help you to sort of see the world in different ways. Dr. May, you have broken through so many glass ceilings. 
which success, and I know this is hard because you, you've had so <laughs> much success, but which success are you most proud of? So I have no single thing I'm most proud of. And <laughs> the, anything that I would tell you that like, I'm like, eh, 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 about, is not what you think it is. Uh, for me, it was literally being able to run several miles without stopping uphill, right? Because I didn't have incredible stamina growing up and I pushed myself to it. That's something that's very personal, right? It's those things that happen when nobody cares to me that are sometimes the most important where it was just my own self-determination I had to get through. And I know that applies to everything else you do, but that those kinds of things are particularly fun or um, I write about in the book, you know, about uh, being afraid of uh, heights. Right? <laughs> and I know it's kind of silly, but being able to get over that fear and it didn't happen until actually I was in the astronaut program. <laughs> Well, I know I have many more questions for you, but I'm going to stop and start to ask some of our viewers questions. Um, so we have Nina is really interested to know what is your favorite planet? And at the same time, we have Riley who wants to know. And it's interesting because I, I know other people asked this question earlier. How did you land when you came back to Earth? <laughs> um, and I don't those are two two quick questions. and. I, I, I don't I don't understand the favorite planet question. I get asked that all the time and I have to make something up every time. I never remember. When I was a little kid, I was fascinated by Venus because it was called, it seemed like it was a twin of the earth, right? In terms of size and being almost in a habitable zone, but it wasn't. Um, so I was always fascinated by Venus. Um, the shuttle lands like a, the shuttle, the space shuttle landed like an airplane, unlike the vehicles um, the, the the rockets now where people come back in a capsule and it lands on a capsule with a parachute on the ground. The the shuttle landed like a an airplane in a runway, which was an incredible, the shuttle was an incredible advancement in space exploration. Even though now we're going back to the heavy lift vehicles that are a rocket that look very similar to the Apollo kind of vehicles. The fact that you had something that could launch and then come back down as and land as an airplane it had a very gentle profile, which meant you could take up some incredible equipment like the Hubble Space Telescope and other things. No, that's that's more. I did not know that. <laughs> um, uh, another um, Kenzie asks, "What is what is a good astronomy book to read?" Uh, Kenzie is age eight. So I. This is not fine where the wind goes, but 100 Year Starship, we did four books that were around space exploration. The first one was called, they're from by Scholastic, they're called True Books. The first one is called 100 Year Starship. Then there's one called Exploring, um, Exploring Our Solar System, I believe. Uh, one is about our sun. And then the other one is about finding new planets, which is really about finding exoplanets, like planets away from our solar system and how that happens. But the exploring our solar system is about all the kinds of probes that went, um, that uh, found out information about different planets. The other is about our sun and how our solar system was formed. And inside of each one, we also talk a lot about the universe as well. Do you have any books that, or are there plans actually to turn, find where the wind goes into a, a picture book? Are there any plans to take your book and, and or, or is there a picture book you recommend that's about you and your journey? No, we're actually going to do that. I was, I was supposed to do that a long time ago. <laughs> and then you get distracted with interstellar flight and other stuff. No, so, I, no. <laughs> I don't know how you find time. But no, we, we definitely want to because there's stories that I need to tell, like about making mud pies. If you ask me what my first science adventure was, it was making mud pies. Oh, wow. Right? And how important that is. But I do want to tell those stories because you can't tell them all in one book. And there are these little pieces of things that I think are fun or even about friends of mine who were actually quite remarkable. Uh, but yes, we're actually... Uh, getting ready to do a picture book, and I have uh, some of the people who work with me 
uh, have been pushing me all along. And so, yes, we've, we've taken our first foray into illustration, so we're there. So we'll see you next year then. No. <laughs> <laughs> if not before, if not before. Um, someone else was wondering um, if you could talk about the camps you've started. So I started, the first thing I did when I left NASA was to start a program called uh, the International Science Camp, The Earth We Share. And it was about promoting science literacy. Uh, science literacy, um, because every day we have to think ourselves, think our way through the day. And science literacy to me is so important because so many of the critical decisions that we have to make in the world today really revolve around science literacy that everyday citizens uh, have to participate in. Notice science literacy is not about uh, solving you know, equations like E equals MC squared. It's really about being able to figure out what to do in terms of medications. I mean, just think about the pandemic that we're in right now. How do you understand the information about the effectiveness of the vaccines? We should be able to do that. It's not that you have to be at the same level of epidemiologist. But also, the reason why I did the, the Earth We Share, we worked with 12 to 16 year olds because that's the age where kids start to fall out of science. And what we decided to do was to make sure that we related science to their everyday lives and that it was experiential. Experiential means that you get to do something. And that's the best way to learn. So we would actually uh, challenge students, 12 to 16 year olds, to work in groups to solve global dilemmas like predict the hot public stocks of the year 2030, design the world's perfect house, how many people can the earth hold? And they worked in teams with children uh, from around the world. Right. We had students from Sierra Leone, from uh, from uh, Nigeria, from Portugal, from Spain, from Sweden, from Derby, Kansas, Los Angeles, Chicago, and they would work in teams to solve these problems. We particularly were interested in also training teachers in experiential education because if we can help teachers feel comfortable being guides in science, then they're going to impact many more students than we ever could. So we've done the camps all over um, multiple times, four-week residential camps. We did a series of camps in Los Angeles uh, with LA Unified School District that were non-residential where we trained teachers and middle school students there. We've even done camps, uh, one-day camps in different places like Tunisia where uh, it was done in French. And currently we're working on a, uh, with a camp and a program in South Africa now uh, that's around um, awareness around space exploration as well. The reason why I believe in camps and these are important is because it's been shown over and over again, it's exposure and the hands-on that makes a difference. And it's not about the next generation of professional scientists, but it's about people understanding they have a right to participate. And we have actively had a number of the students who went through the camps who had not intended to go into science, decided to go into science as careers, including a PhD in neuroscientist. Well, that's a huge win. And I know those hands-on experiences, right? The problem solving, basically, I, I just think that having those programs is is amazing, an amazing opportunity for any, and are people still able to participate? Are you still running those camp programs? We're trying to figure out how to do some of them virtually, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, right. Um, but when we do things, when we do them, because we're working with, we have kids working groups that aren't necessarily the ones that they always work with or with different folks. The reason it's important, because if you say design the world's perfect house, which we did at three different camps, um, Perfect is gonna depend on the people who you're in the group with, right? What is your worldview when you design, decide on the world? So from those different camps, one time people just, the kids decided to design a luxury house. They knew they could design something else, but they decided to design, design, decided to design a luxury house. In another one, they decided to design a house that could be built anywhere in the world prefabricated and it was circular so that there are issues around prayer and which where you should face 
you could have had an opportunity to resolve that. Mm -hmm. And then another case, they decided that a zero footprint, energy footprint house would be perfect for the world. But in each case, they got to understand that as we make these decisions about technology and design, uh, policies, it really depends on who's involved. Well, and bringing lots of people together gives different perspectives and richness, the, that diversity. So that that sounds really wonderful. And I hope you're able to, to enable, I know with time zones, it's probably a challenge, and able to make that happen again. Um, I know there's many more questions than we have time for because we're approaching the, the top of the hour. Um, and so I wanted to say a, a few things. One is we've received questions on how can we buy this book? <laughs> um, and, and in the credits, it will tell you, um, I know IndieBound, I know um, Bookshop, I know Amazon, I know basically it is my understanding and, and Dr. May, tell me if I'm wrong, but any bookseller, Walmart, um, you will be able to buy the book and even pre-order the book um, soon, and it should arrive by February 23rd. Is that correct? I don't know how they ship, so I'm not going to order. <laughs> order. <laughs> order. <laughs> but, um, I, I don't. I don't know, so I can't. I'm not going to um, obligate any of the booksellers about when it's going to arrive. But I know it will be released. It will be in stores by February 23rd. And we will also, and you can pre-order it as well. And so we're really excited about it because we want to make sure that we get a lot of things out. We're going to be uh, putting together uh, snippets of things and maybe even some pictures out of the book. You may really like it. We can put them into posters and other things. But it's really about trying to have fun. And what I'd like to say is, no, the stories aren't all about me going into science. We have a range of stories <laughs> in it. And that would be fun, but you can get it. Yeah, any any books, any of your favorite is your favorite bookseller. And I do think that one of the things that should resonate to any reader is that they are stories about real life, and then to know that that those real life stories were building blocks, um, <laughs> who made you who you are, who accomplished so much, and are truly a hero to so many and an inspiration. So. Um, Dr. May, thank you so much for spending the last 45 minutes with us, sharing your, your insights, your inspirations with us, your challenges, um, and how you overcame many of them. Um, as we close, it's actually my pleasure to reintroduce um, Asala's Sylvia Cyrus to share about our closing song, which is Lift Every Voice and Sing. Sylvia? Thank you. Lift Every Voice and Sing is known as the Black National Anthem, and it was written as a poem by NAACP leader James Weldon Johnson, who was born in Jacksonville, Florida. And his brother set the song to uh, the poem to song. His name was John Rosamond Johnson in 1899. The song was performed by a choir of 500 school children at the segregated Stanton School where James Weldon Johnson was the principal. And segregated meaning that only black children could go to that school, white children were not allowed to go. This song was sung on February 12, 1900 as a part of a celebration for President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And that was a day that black people and others celebrated way before it was a national holiday. This song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, has a special meaning for African-American history and also has meaning for all Americans. It represents a celebration of liberty, remembering our struggles, and it is a hopeful prayer for a prosperous future. The Association for the Study of African-American Life and History has a branch or chapter in, J in Jacksonville, Florida, and it is named the James Weldon Johnson Branch. Without further ado, you will hear the singing of that song by one of the choirs from the historically black colleges and universities. Enjoy.
Wow. The incredible power of song and the amazing images that were shared throughout that amazing song. Listening to the Black National Anthem at the close of this program was really um, a true highlight of, of celebration. And I truly think there is no better way to launch our celebration of Black History Month um, than to have this as the closer, but also to, to be able to have spoken to Dr. May Jemison. Really a wonderful, wonderful time. And we, we're glad you stayed with us. We appreciate all your questions and we hope we will see you again. So don't forget to tune in to PBS Books. Thank you, have a wonderful day.